So here we're going to take a look at the theology of 1 Corinthians. Um, so we'll begin with kind of the Christology we find. Uh, Paul's favorite description of Jesus is as the Christ, uh, especially as when he wants to talk about Christ as the source of life and blessings. Paul also acknowledges Jesus as Lord, uh, especially when he's trying to stress the concept of Jesus' authority. Uh, the death, burial, uh, and bodily resurrection, uh, which was witnessed by others, is central to the content of the gospel. Uh, throughout the letter, uh, Paul addresses the issues the Corinthians were raising, especially their uh, spiritual enthusiasm uh, by applying a kind of a theology of the cross and understanding the role that is played with suffering, uh, the suffering of the Messiah as a model for the way in which followers of Christ are also going to live out their existence. So in the accepted Pauline letters, uh, Paul uses the word cross typically to focus on the scandal of the cross, something uh, hard to believe. Um, in uh, disputed Pauline letters, the cross is spoken about in terms of its salvific benefits. Uh, the message of the cross, then, is the gospel, uh, and it is the mystery of God. In other words, something that had been hidden, the concept of mystery is something that was not known but has now been revealed. So this uh, news about what has happened on the cross, the news about what God is doing in the world because of the cross, this is good news, um, and it is something that had been hidden but has now been made known. Uh, the Holy Spirit is another big part of the theology of 1 Corinthians, so there's a lot that we could say about this, um, but uh, the Spirit reveals God's wisdom uh, at work in the cross. As it is the mystery of God. Uh, the Spirit indwells uh, individual Christians and also the church collectively. So this concept of the indwelling, uh, the presence of the Spirit, both in the life of the individual Christian and when the church is assembled. The, the Spirit is also a sanctifying influence in the life of, of, the, of uh, individual Christians. So, in other words, not only are Christians already saints, already sanctified, already made holy, uh, but uh, there is this process as well as which they are being made holy. So, kind of a, you both, uh, you have, you don't, you already have holiness, but holiness is also something that is being uh, developed in the life of the Christian. The Spirit imparts gifts. I'm going to say a little bit more about these spiritual gifts here in a few minutes. Um, but he imparts gifts for the mutual edifications of Christians uh, within the assembly. As far as soteriology in 1 Corinthians, um, this is the kind of teachings about salvation. Uh, believers are brought into union uh, with, with God's Son uh, by their faith. This faith is marked by baptism, during which time believers are washed uh, of their sins. They are set apart as holy objects, uh, and then they are made right with God. So that language there in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, uh, you may want to uh, pause and take a look to um, this idea of justification. So a lot can be said about justification and Pauline thought. Um, I'm kind of, I hold the, the view kind of along the same lines that is espoused by that of N.T. Wright, that when Paul talks about justification, he is, he ha this is covenantal language, and that he is talking about not being made right in regards to the law, but is being made right in terms of the covenant and the covenant requirement, that is the covenant made with Abraham. So uh, it's during baptism that believers are also incorporated into the body of believers. It brings them into, into that, uh, that body, that assembly, that community. Salvation was often uh, understood as freedom, so to be freed from an enemy, freed from danger, uh, and so, of course, freedom is a very important concept amongst Greeks and Romans. Um, and uh, so in the Hellenistic world, uh, freedom is an important concept and value. And so Paul 
oftentimes thinks of the believer in their prior existence as being kind of enslaved, um, enchained or bound to uh, forces and powers and passions, but when they are brought into Christ, they are freed from all of those. But at the same time, a believer can also still be enslaved, as it were, to, uh, to Christ. Paul sees himself as a slave of Christ. So you, you have freedom from certain things, but it is also a freedom that is enjoyed with a new Lord, a new master. Believers will experience uh, in the future a bodily resurrection in a manner similar to the one Jesus experienced. Very key concept in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, this idea that um, Christian resurrection is not some kind of raised to a new life that we exist now, and then we enjoy that life now, but then one day we're going to be dead, and then that, you know, once we're deceased, that's it, that we're, we're, life has ended for us. But the idea that just as Jesus Christ was bodily raised, so too believers will be bodily raised. That's, and so therefore, it is important what one does with one's body, uh, because that body will be raised to this new life. Uh, we also mentioned here something about the ecclesiology, that is, its understanding of the church in 1 Corinthians. Uh, the church is the church of God. In other words, it is something that God has created. Uh, God is sovereign over it, um, and not only has he created, it belongs to him. It's his possession. Uh, and it is the body. It is the community. It is the group uh, that belongs to Christ, that recognizes Christ as Lord, that is um, sustained by Christ. Uh, so in the community, uh, God uh, sanctifies in Christ and he empowers it with the Spirit. So we can talk about something of kind of a Trinitarian type language. Um, though we have to be careful of not to impose a Trinitarian uh, doctrine onto the writings of Paul. This, nevertheless, this idea of God is at work, Christ is at work, the Spirit is at work, all three are at work doing things to the body of believers. It is the community of the saints, uh, again, those who are consecrated, those who are made holy and are being made holy uh, by God for God's service. But the church is made up of those in Christ, uh, some who are the sukikoi, um, and some of those who are the sarkikoi, so the soulish uh, people, spirit people, uh, and the fleshly people and some who are the nomadicoi, the spiritual uh, people. So uh, Paul seems to think of individuals along these lines, each one. Uh, sometimes, you know, the person who is the sukikoi, there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, um, this is the person who is uh, without the spirit. Um, and so... Know, the different from the pneumatikoi, which has the spirit. But we also have the sarkikoi, which are the these people who are led by the flesh. And this concept of flesh is this, you know, this idea of, of kind of a power or a passion or desires that guides them. So and there are people in Corinth that see themselves as spiritual people. It's not, it's not that Paul doesn't want them to think of themselves as spiritual people but they must have a misunderstanding of what it means to be a spiritual person. The assembly is a place where believers express their fellowship uh, with one another. One of the ways which they express that is through the Lord's Supper and service to one another. And they serve each other through the ministry of gifts, the spiritual gifts. Uh, but all of this has to be done in a manner that is orderly and that is contextually sensitive. Now, by contextually sensitive, I'm picking up here this language of what is told towards women, um, and uh, how women are not supposed to speak to the prophets. Um, and so culturally, in that cultural context, uh, it may be insensitive. It would be inappropriate for a married woman to be speaking to a, a male. Um, that should not be done. And so some of that cultural context is, is at work. So, you know, while that cultural context may not be the same, United States context or in some other Western country context, 
still may be the case in, in other cultural contexts. So, but Paul is just responding, as, as it were, within his own cultural context, the ways in which the church continues to serve each other, but in light of, of the, the way in which people have impressions about what's appropriate. The assembly also practices self-discipline upon those professing belief, but whose, contact, whose conduct is visibly and seriously inconsistent with the freedom from sin brought about by their salvation in Christ. And so the chapter 5 is particularly this situation of a man who is uh, having sexual relationships with his father's wife, so in other words, his stepmother. We don't know all the reasons why he is doing this, um, but uh, this type of incestuous uh, relationship uh, should not be tolerated by the, uh, by the Christian community. They seem to see it as a way in which they are freed from um, constraints that may be placed upon them. Um, but Paul sees you know, even this type of behavior would, is abhorrent to uh, non-Christians. Even they know this is not the type of behavior that one should engage in. And so it's an issue of shame, as Paul sees it, for the church, not an not a issue of honor. Uh, that they are tolerating this kind of behavior. And so they need to discipline this individual so that they will learn learn that this kind of sin, uh, that is uh, a very serious sin, uh, a sin that should be seen as quite repugnant and, and rejected by the Christian community, uh, that they see it as um, something they need to address. So um, kind of the last slide I'll just here have is about spiritual gifts particularly in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. There's a lot that people are interested in on this subject, so a few things we can highlight. Uh, so Paul's view of the spiritual gifts, or I have here spiritual people um, in chapter 2, verse 1. Uh, the Greek word that is used in chapter 2, uh, verse 1, uh, the language of uh, now concerning uh, pneumatikon, uh, pneumaticone, it could be either a masculine or a neuter, depends if it's case. If it is a masculine, then we're, he's talking about uh, spiritual people. If it's a neuter, a neuter, then it's regarding spiritual gifts. But most translations translate it as if the case here is a neuter. Um, but it could be a, a, a masculine uh, case, and then that way he's talking about concerning spiritual people, in other words, how a spiritual person ought to behave, uh, and because there are certain people in the Corinthian church who are claiming to be spiritual, but the way in which they're behaving is not, as Paul sees, being led by the Spirit. So people led by the Spirit, uh, one thing is that they don't curse Jesus. So someone might wonder, well, what kind of person in the church would curse Jesus? Well, it could be a person who may believe uh, in Christ as the Son of God, but makes a distinction between Christ and Jesus. In other words, they're not very interested in the human being, Jesus, but they're interested in this kind of redeemer figure, Christ, who saves and makes a separation between Christ and Jesus. That's why it's so important that Paul stresses at times that it is Jesus Christ is Lord. That we have the name Jesus in there because we're talking about the human person uh, who is the Christ and who also is Lord. Uh, and so uh, spiritual people confess Jesus, the human being, as the Christ and as the Lord. The, the Corinthians should not be competitive with regards to gifts because a gift uh, does not indicate uh, a person's status in the body. In other words, there are different gifts that are given by the Spirit to the person. Uh, to individuals in the church. Every Christian should receive a gift from the Spirit, um, and, uh, but if your gift is different than somebody else's gift, that doesn't mean that you are not a valuable person in, in the body. Uh, you are still valuable. You, you have the same status despite whatever gift you are given. And that doesn't mean that certain gifts might not have a hierarchy. There might not be a priority of gifts, and Paul certainly thinks of one particular gift as having a greater priority than others. But despite what gift you're given, um, whether it's one of the priority ones or not, your status is equal to everybody else in the body. Christians should give greater honor to those who might seem to have less status. 
um, even if someone's gift is not one of those that are in the priority or in the upper hierarchy, that should not lead us to look at that person as having less status. Everybody in the assembly has the same status despite what gift they have. Uh, love for one another. Now, the chapter 13 is a very popular uh, chapter for a lot of people, but it also could be easily misunderstood. Um, in chapter 13, Paul is not calling love a spiritual gift. Uh, instead, this little excursion that is taking place is how whatever gift you have, it needs to be uh, exercised with love. So uh, every individual is called to exercise their gift with love. And if they're using their gift with love, they're using it for the betterment of others. No gift ought to be exercised by someone who is not thinking with love for how their gift can edify and encourage uh, someone else. Prophecy is the greatest spiritual gift because it is a speaking gift which edifies, it encourages and consoles. Now, there are other speaking gifts, like speaking in tongues, um, words of encouragement, um, but um, those speaking gifts may not edify, encourage, and console to the extent that Paul sees prophecy. Paul is, is kind of a prophetic person himself, um, but he sees prophecy as that gift that should be desired and should, you know, something that individuals can, can want as opposed to um, other individuals in the Corinthian church who were highlighting, emphasizing uh, the ecstatic speech uh, as the greatest gift. Those uh, prophecies, uh, th through prophecy, those who don't believe will become convicted that God is with uh, Christians. And so that's one of the reasons why prophecy is so valuable. People hear the word of God uh, proclaimed, and there's something about that proclamation that makes them think that God is with them, especially if uh, a prophecy is not only revealing something that is hidden, which is what prophecy can do, or uh, revealing something about the future that will occur. And once it does occur, then uh, prophecy, once the prophecy is confirmed, then again, the idea that God is with the, the prophet, and with the community that supports the prophet. And finally, the assembly should be conducted orderly, so that gifts may be exercised that will be built up by the church. Uh, Paul doesn't understand spiritual gifts as something that um, takes over a person, that they're not still able to exercise their mental faculties. They can still control the use of those gifts, so they don't just act uh, spontaneously with lack of control, uh, but they should take turns. Different people who have their gifts, whatever it may be, take turns to exercise those gifts because they're exercising those gifts to edify one another because it's the spirit who gives gives the gift. Um, one side thing I would say as well about spiritual gifts is that spiritual gifts are not owned by the individual. Um, a person may have a gift in one particular assembly or context, but that doesn't mean that they have that gift if they were to go to a different assembly or a different context. The gift is not something that is owned by them. The gift is the spirit, and the spirit gives the gift to the individual in the context in which they're at. So it may be the case that some people are seen within the assembly as being gifted in one way, in other words, in one way in which that person edifies, encourages them. But if that person was to go to a different assembly, a different assembly might not see that person as gifted with that gift that one, another congregation, another assembly saw. Instead, they may see other gifts. So it's not that a gift is a person possesses a gift and they have that gift wherever they go. It is the spirit who possesses the gift and the spirit decides and discerns when to give that gift or exercise that gift to that person in a specific assembly for the edification of that uh, assembly. Anyway, quick little review of the, some of the theological uh, contributions of 1 uh, Corinthians.